The Demon Spell by Hume Nisbet. It was about the time when spiritualism was all the craze in England, and no party was reckoned without a spirit wrapping seance being included amongst the other entertainments. One night I had been invited to the house of a friend who was a great believer in the manifestations from the unseen world and who had asked for my special edification, a well-known trans medium, a pretty as well as heaven-gifted girl who you will be sure to like. I know, he said as he asked me. I do not believe in the return of spirits yet. Thinking to be amused, consented to attend at the hour appointed. At that time I had just returned from a long sojourn abroad, and was in a very delicate state of health. Easily impressed by outward influences, and nervous to a most extraordinary extent, to the hour appointed I found myself at my friend's house, and was then introduced to the sitters who had assembled to witness the phenomena. Some were strangers like myself to the rules of the table, others who were adepts took their places at once in the order to which they had in former meetings attended. The trance medium had not yet arrived, and while waiting upon her coming, we sat down and opened the seance with a hymn. We had just furnished the second verse when the door opened, and the medium glided in, and took her place on a vacant seat by my side, joining in with the others in the last verse after which we all sat motionless with our hands resting upon the table, waiting upon the first manifestation from the unseen world. Now, although I thought all this performance was very ridiculous, there was something in the silence and the dim light, for the gas had been turned low down and the room seemed filled with shadows, something about the fragile figure at my side with her drooping head, which thrilled me with a curious sense of fear and icy horror, such as I had never felt before. I am not by nature imaginative or inclined to superstition, but from the moment that young girl had entered the room I felt as if a hand had been laid upon my heart, a cold iron hand that was compressing it and causing it to stop throbbing. My sense of hearing had also grown more acute, sensitive so that the beating of the watch in my vest pocket sounded like the thumping of a quartz-crushing machine, and the measured breathing of those about me as loud and nerve-disturbing as the snorting of a steam engine. Only when I turned to look upon the trance medium did I become soothed. Then it seemed as if a cold air wave had passed through my brain, subduing, for the time being, those awful sounds. She is possessed whispered my host on the other side of me. Wait, and she will speak presently, and tell us whom we have got besides us. As we sat and waited, the table moved several times under our hands, while knockings at intervals took place in the table and all round the room. A most weird and blood-curdling, yet ridiculous performance, which made me feel half inclined to run out with fear and half inclined to sit still and laugh. On the whole, I think, however, that horror had a more complete possession of me. Presently she raised her head and laid her hand upon mine, beginning to speak in a strange monotonous faraway voice. This is my first visit since I passed from earth life, and you have called me here. I shivered as her hand touched mine but had not strength to withdraw it from her light, soft grasp. I am what you would call a lost soul, that is, I am in the lowest sphere. Last week I was in the body, but met my death down Whitechapel Way. I was what you call an unfortunate, aye, unfortunate enough. Shall I tell you how it happened? The medium's eyes were closed, and whether it was distorted imagination or not, she appeared to have grown older, decidedly debauched looking, since she sat down, or rather, as if a light, filmy mask of degrading sodden vice had replaced the former delicate features. No one spoke, and the trance medium continued. I had been out all that day, and without any luck or food, 
so that I was dragging my wearied body along through the slush and mud, for it had been wet all day, and I was drenched to the skin and miserable, oh, ten thousand times more wretched than I am now. For the earth is a far worse hell for such as I than our hell here. I had importuned several passers by as I went along that night, but none of them spoke to me, for work had been scarce all this winter, and I suppose I did not look so tempting as I have been. Only once a man answered me, a dark faced, middle sized man with a soft voice, and much better dressed than my usual companions. He asked me where I was going, and then left me, putting a coin into my hand, for which I thanked him. Being just in time for the last public house, I hurried up, but on going to the bar and looking at my hand, I found it to be a curious foreign coin with outlandish figures on it, which the landlord would not take. So I went out again to the dark fog and rain without my drink after all. There was no use going any further that night. I turned up the court where my lodgings were, intending to go home and get asleep, since I could get no food. When I felt something touch me softly from behind, as if someone had caught hold of my shawl, then I stopped and turned about to see who it was. I was alone, and with no one near me, nothing but fog and the half-light from the court lamp. Yet I felt as if something had not got hold of me, though I could not see what it was, and what it was gathering about me. I tried to scream out, but could not, as this unseen grasp closed upon my throat and choked me, and then I fell down and for a moment forgot everything. Next moment I woke up, outside my own poor mutilated body, and stood watching the fell work going on as you see it now. Yes, I saw it all as the medium ceased speaking and a mangled corpse lying on a muddy pavement, demonic, dark, pock-marked face bending over it with the lean claws outspread in the dense fog instead of a body like the half-formed incarnation of muscles. That is what did it, and you will know it again, she said. I have come for you to find it. Is he an Englishman? I asked. As the vision faded away and the room once more became definite, it is neither man nor woman, but it lives as I do. It is with me now, and maybe with you tonight. Still, if you will have me instead of it, I can keep it back. Only you must wish for me with all your might. The seance was now becoming too horrible and by general consent our host turned up the gas. Then I saw for the first time the medium, now relieved from her evil possessions, a beautiful girl of about nineteen, with, I think, the most glorious brown eyes I had ever before looked into. Do you believe what you have been speaking about? I asked her, as we were sitting, talking together. What was that? about the murdered woman. I, I don't know anything at all, only that I have been sitting at the table. I never know what my trances are. Was she speaking the truth? Her dark eyes looked truth, so that I could not doubt her. That night, when I went to my lodgings, I must confess that it was some time before I could make up my mind to go to bed. I was decidedly upset and nervous, and wished that I had never gone to this spirit meeting, making a mental vow, as I threw off my clothes and hastily got into bed, that it was the last unholy gathering I would ever attend. For the first time in my life I could not put out the gas. I felt as if the room was filled with ghosts, as if this pair of ghastly spectres the murderer and his victims had accompanied me home and were at that moment disputing the possession of me. So instead, I pulled the bedclothes over my head, it being a cold night, and went that fashion off to sleep. Twelve o'clock and the anniversary of the day that Christ was born. 
Yes, I heard it striking from the street spire, and counted the strokes, slowly tolled out, listening to the echoes from other steeples. After this one had ceased, as I lay awake in the gas-lit room, feeling as if I was not alone this Christmas morn, thus, while I was trying to think what had made me wake so suddenly, I seemed to hear a far-off echo cry, Come to me. At the same time, the bedclothes were slowly pulled from my bed and left in a confused mass on the floor. Is that you, Polly? I cried, remembering the spirit seance and the name by which the spirit had announced herself when she took possession. Three distinct knocks resounded on the bedpost at my ear. The signal for yes. Can you speak to me? Yes. An echo rather than a voice replied, while I felt my flesh creepy, yet strove to be brave. Can I see you? No. Feel you? Instantly, the feeling of a light, cold hand touched my brow and passed over my face. In God's name, what do you want? To save the girl that I was in tonight. It is after her, and it will kill her if you do not come quickly. In an instant I was out of the bed and tumbling my clothes on anyway, horrified through it all, yet feeling as if Polly were helping me to dress. There was a candy and dagger on my table, which I had brought from Ceylon, an old dagger which I had bought for its antiquity and design, and this I snatched as I left the room with that light, unseen hand leading me out the house along the deserted, snow-covered streets. I did not know where the transmedium lived, but I followed where the light grasp led me through the wild, blinding snowdrift, round the corners and through shortcuts, with my head down and the flakes falling thickly about me, until at last I arrived at a silent square and in front of a house which by some instinct I knew that I must enter. Over by the other side of the street I saw a man standing looking up to a dimly lit lighted window, but I could not see him very distinctly, and I did not pay much attention to him at the time, but rushed instead up the front steps and into the house, that unseen hand still pulling me forward. How that door opened! or if it did open, I could not say. I only know that I got in, and as we got into the places in a dream, and up the inner stairs, I passed into the bedroom where the light was burning dimly. It was her bedroom, and she was struggling in the thug-like grasp of those same demon claws, and the rest of it drifting away to nothingness. I saw it all at a glance, her half-naked form with the disarranged bedclothes, as the unformed demon of muscles clutched a delicate throat, and then I was at it like a fury with my candy and dagger, slashing crossways at those cruel claws and that evil face, while bloody streaks followed the course of my knife, making ugly stains until at last it ceased struggling and disappeared like a horrid nightmare, as a half-strangled girl, now released from the fell grip, woke up the house with her screams, while from her release hands dropped a strange coin, which I took possession of. Thus I left her, feeling that my work was done, going downstairs as I had come up without impediment or even seemingly in the slightest degree attracting the attention of the other inmates of the house, who rushed in their nightdresses towards the bedroom, from whence the screams were issuing, in the street again, with the coin in one hand and my dagger in the other, I rushed, and though I remembered the man who I had seen looking up at the window, was he there still? Yes, but on the ground in a confused black mass amongst the white snow, as if it had been struck down. 
I went over to where he lay and looked at him. Was he dead? Yes. I turned him over and saw that his throat had been gashed from ear to ear, and all over his face the same dark, pallid, pockmarked, evil face and clawed-like hands. I saw the dark slashes of my candy and dagger, while the soft white snow around him was stained with crimson life pools. As I looked, I heard the clock strike one, while from the distance sounded the chant of coming weights. Then I turned and fled blindly into the darkness. The End